I am delighted to be here and I am just so thrilled to see your face uh, and, and that you have taken the time to come and share with me some of my research and, and uh, stories and things like that. Uh, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Drew. 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 When Drew, uh, when I came in, I asked Drew, you know, how many, you know, how many people do you usually have? Because I'm just impressed that at 2.30, th at, <laughs> at the archives, and no less, that there are people here. And he says, we have a pretty good turnout, you know. We have a dedicated group of people who come. So I truly, truly appre appreciate you coming. I laughed and told him, I said, well, would a storyteller, you only need one other person. And I brought him with me. <laughs> this is my husband, Bill Harris. And uh, he, uh, he, he, things get run by him first. We, you know, wring them out and wash them and wring them out again, sometime in a very calm, collected, some kind of uh, way, and sometimes in a turbulent kind of way, and I'm the turbulent one. <laughs> he just sits there and goes. But I want you to know that anything you hear today, it's his fault. <laughs> it is his fault because I got into reenacting and reenacting from, uh, the, from the Civil War because of my husband. Up until I met him, I knew nothing about reenacting in the Civil War. And it was going on all around me. And that was scary, <laughs> you know, to live someplace with this many, with thousands of people involved and you know absolutely uh, nothing about it. Talk about head in the sand. It was. It was a case of finding that I had had my head in the sand. And so when I met him and he started telling me about, he was a member of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, and he started telling me about it and I'm going, it was like a whole new door opening up. I was already a storyteller, but he took me to a place called the Blockade Runner. And he just took me by, it's a sut sutlery, and they sell Civil War, you know, attire, regalia, all that kind of stuff. And he took me in so I could see it. And then I went over and there was a dress there. I said, that's what you can get me for Christmas. He says, what? I just thought, you know, I just brought you back. I said, don't you know this opens up a whole new genre? A whole new genre of stories. A whole wealth of other places to research. And believe me, it, has, it never ceases to amaze me what I have been able to find out in reference to Civil War history. You know, I thought we knew it all, you know. There was war. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, right? Ah, ha, 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 ha. You know, and that was it. What else is there to know? Well, I guess I, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Our classrooms are getting to be that way. Our classrooms are telling children that that is all there is to know. And for us and the future of our country, that's dangerous. It's dangerous because if you don't know the history behind this war, you have missed one of the most important events that helped to shape our country. The only other event that was, comes anywhere near being as important, if it's more important or near, is the first, the first war, the Revolutionary War. But this one, is really important because it challenges the first one. It, it brings up issues to remind people what that first war was about. And that's what we're missing in our classrooms today. And I am glad to have you here. I'm going to do a commercial first. <laughs> that's why I'm glad you're here. Now, most of you I know have don't have grandchildren young enough for this book, but you know, buy it anyway. <laughs> and donate it to a fifth grade teacher or a middle school librarian. Because I wrote this book, it's called Fighting for Freedom, a documented story. 
I wrote this book so that teachers in the classroom, in, particularly in Tennessee, but anywhere else too, but particularly in Tennessee, the first time our children study the Civil War is fifth grade, and they have to have primary source documents. And I have pictures of primary source documents in here. And it will give teachers the opportunity to go beyond Mr. Lincoln. And that's important for us today. It's, it is so important today because it addresses the very issues that were being addressed at the time of Mr. Lincoln. So hopefully it will give a broader perspective. And that's the reason I, I wrote the book. I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but, but that's, that's what I'm here for. Hopefully to share some things that we generally don't think about. Now, I want to introduce myself. My, my name is Julia Egan. Barbara Marthel is my fourth great granddaughter. I live in Wilson County. I've lived there for, I was born in Tennessee live in Wilson County, and I'm married to Armand Egan. We are free people of color in 1860. We were also free in 1850. So, and we own a small farm in Lagarda, Tennessee. You can pull us up. I tell you, I tell you how Barbara found out about me. She's always doing research. She's always been interested in history. And so she's always wanting to tell stories. And I listen to her a lot of times. What, what are you telling today? I'd be thinking in my mind. And so she was telling these stories about the Civil War. Well, finally, I told her, you know, Barbara, I tell you about telling history. There's your point of view and their point of view and there's my point of view. And I haven't heard you say a thing about my point of view. I am a free person of color in Wilson County. And no, it's amazing. Nobody talks about us. Nobody. All you hear is about the slaves. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got no problems with that because my ancestors were slaves. And I have cousins and uncles that are slaves today in 1860. But I just want to know why it is that you never talk about me. I think that's strange. And I get particularly upset when you start talking about Mr. Lincoln and this freedom that he's promising. Because you see, I wasn't waiting around for Mr. Lincoln to free me. 1850, I was free. And I was free beyond that. Barbara just hadn't been able to find the paperwork yet. But a whole lot of people like me in Wilson County were free. We weren't waiting for Mr. Lincoln. As a matter of fact, Mr. Lincoln is not uh, on our list of favorite people. I'm telling you, he's not, and I can tell you why. Okay, I want you to go back a little bit. 1822. 1822 in New York, okay? They shipped cotton bales were exported from New York in 1822. They shipped $4 million worth of cotton out of New York in 1822. Now, in 1860, which is the time that I'm living in, they shipped $12 million worth of cotton out of New York, out of the port of New York. Now, in 1870, they shipped $46 million worth of cotton out of New York. Guess what, folks? They don't grow cotton in New York. And they say, we are dependent on slaves. What do you think he was fighting that war 
for? It wasn't for me. How do I know it wasn't for me? Well, let me tell you. I got a little something I'll read to you. The reason I know it wasn't for me is because Mr. Lincoln was the very first president to invite a group of black men to the White House for a talk, for an interview, for a sit down, exchange. He was the first president to do that. And hey, that's pretty impressive. Mr. Douglas was with him, along with other renowned, respectable black men that went to Washington to visit Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln was very courteous. He was very nice to them. And the reason he was being nice is because he wanted to put a proposition before them. And that proposition was that all free people of color, people like me, Mr. Douglas and many, many more, be willing to leave this country. Because Mr. Lincoln decided, you know, we are never, he told them, you're never going to be equal to me. And I have no intentions of seeing that you're equal to me. So since we both know, let's take the gloves off, let's not pretend here. Since we both know that you are not going to become an equal person in this country, when we free you, and any of you that are already free, you need to go somewhere. We'll even pay your way. Now, I own a farm, a small farm, yes, in Lagarda. Thank you. In Lagarda. We have worked hard to purchase that farm. It was not given to us. We purchased it. Now, thank goodness we didn't live in the land of Lincoln because the land of Lincoln wouldn't allow, allow us to purchase land there. Like most of the northern states, people of color could not purchase land. And Mr. Lincoln supported it, helped pass the law. Do you hear me? because he was not for us having the same rights as other people. So the place that we purchased land was where we were born, right here in the South in Wilson County. And Mr. Lincoln wants me to sell it. Now what do you think my, I will get out of the price of the land if I sell it and it gets out that it's being sold because somebody has passed a law that because I'm a free person of color, I need to leave. So why would Mr. Lincoln be on my list of most likable people? No way, no how, no time. That was in 1860. Just because, you know, just to make sure you don't think that I am an exceptional free person of color, let me read to you an article that was taken from the New Orleans Tribune in 1864. Okay? I've got to get my granddaughter to get me better glasses. <laughs> this was written, it was reprinted in a Boston paper, but the New Orleans Tribune was a black paper in New Orleans in 1864. And the, uh, the, the uh, Boston, Massachusetts picked up the article. This is what it says, 1864. Remember 1860, Mr. Lincoln felt this way. Boston, Massachusetts, September 22nd, a Negro-owned New Orleans newspaper has warned there may be a war of races if the proud Anglo-Saxons, Mr. Lincoln, attempt to, uh, to deceive blacks into any scheme of colonization. They have been trying it since the 
22. They've been trying the scheme of colon colonization. Do they suppose, the New Orleans Tribune asks, that the Negroes could be treated like the Indians? That five million could be gathered into any section of this country without preparing, tr be preparing troubles for a future generation, a war of races. The Tribune article also condemns New Orleans Negroes who want a land grant from Congress for colonization. These men, the papers say, are incapable of representing the black population of New Orleans. The colored people, the Tribune continues, have formed the foundation of the country and have contributed to her prosperity and have defended her on every occasion. Hence, they have as much right to live in this country as other men. I hope Mr. Lincoln got a copy of that article because that's the way we feel. So I tell that story because later in your time when people tell people there were blacks who supported the Confederacy, they just think, oh, that could not be. Why? No, they wouldn't have done that. Why would they fight to be slaves? I wasn't fighting to be slaves, a slave. I was fighting for freedom. That's what I was fighting for. If I was a slave, I was fighting to be free. And there's a long history of it. Because in that first Revolutionary War, you remember I ta told you about, the slaves fought for freedom there too. In fact, they volunteered first until some dumb general from the North said, you can't fight. <laughs> and, you know, the father of our country even decided to back that general. No free people of color, no slaves can fight for this war of independence from England. Well, some general from England decided, oh good, I'm glad they say they can't fight. I tell you what, boys, you come over here and fight, we'll give you your freedom. Mr. Washington backed up and free people of color fought in that war. One of them was in my family an extended family. This is my first cousin's fourth great-grandfather. He fought as a free man of color in the Revolutionary War for our country. These are his free papers when he came to Wilson County. These are the papers he carried. He was one of his descendants were some of the wealthier or better off to do free people of color in Wilson County. He had a brother that owned slaves. So we were fighting for freedom. That's why we would have gone to war. That's why we would have fought for the Confederacy. Now that was a time we all knew this. Your grandparents knew that. They went to reunions together. What has happened? We have a better educational system today than has ever existed, right? We pour more money into education today than we've ever poured into education in this country today. Your, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your mothers and fathers knew it. Many of them went to reunions, free people of color who fought for the Confederacy. How is it that our children don't know it? 
That's why I tell the story I tell today. That's why I say to people, it's important that you know about free people of color. Because I'm telling you that I don't care what, as bad as this, in other words, in spite of slavery, the real opportunity, the real place of opportunity for people of color was here in the South. It's because you don't know all the rest that you think it's the worst place black folks could be. And there's many times of, all you have to do is go to the archives today. You know, ancestor.com and go and you will see, you, you just see it and you go, how is it that we don't know this today? Let me tell you about my family. This is Julius, my farm. We have on my farm, it's a small farm. We have 16 acres of improved land. That means we've planted something on it, we're using it. We have our own farm home, we own our home. We have two horses, two milk cows, nine sheep, 12 swine. We have about 16 acres of land, which would say we have like five acres in corn, five acres in wheat, and for pasture and a potato patch. We use the wheat for selling as well as consumption. We have sweet potatoes because they're really, really good for you and they taste wonderful. We use our horsage for tillage, pulling wagons, and for transportation. We have sheep that we would use for wool, for sale, and consumption. We also have one or two pear, uh, fruit trees, pear tree, peach tree. We use this, the access material to pay our taxes. Yes, we pay taxes as free people of color. But Mr. Lincoln wants me to leave. Keep that in mind. Okay, we use it to buy the things that we need. Thread, staples, all our, our farm equipment, our mules, and whatever. That's what we have. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot. So I got to thinking, now how can I get this over to people, how important this is? You've heard of world vision. You probably, like me, you get this particularly at Christmas time and whatever, you know, because they're asking people to help people in other countries. All right. 28 farm animals today. If you give 28 farm animals to somebody in Africa or some country, developing country, if you give these 28 farm animals, that farm will feed 10 families. I have on my land in 1860 as a free person of color twice this. That means I can feed 20 families. So that gives you an idea. And we were not well off free people of color. We were what you call the middle class today. But Mr. Lincoln is trying to take it away from us. Sound familiar? You think we're not facing the same kinds of issues today. That's the reason it's important for us to know our history. So that tells you about me. And I'm hoping that it will tell you about why when the call for war, when the call came to defend my farm, I was too old to go. My husband was too old to go, but the potatoes that I didn't need, you think we didn't send it to our Confederate boys? Yes, we did. Because we were protecting our land. We were protecting our family. That's the reason it's important for us today to know slave and free, we made this country great. 
and we have nothing to be ashamed of. It is not a disgrace to be a slave. It is not a disgrace to own a slave. What is a disgrace is to mistreat each other. That's another story. And what is important is that we understand that in the time that I lived in, slavery was legal. It's also important to understand that in the time that I lived in, slavery was a worldwide institution. Now, that will bring me to the first song that I want to share with you. Remember, I'm conveying information. I'm not America's idol. <laughs> ah, little water though. Sitting on the roadside on a summer day, chatting with my messmates, passing time away, flying in the shadows underneath the trees. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. You can sing it with me if you want. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. When a horseman passes, the soldiers have a rule to cry out their loudest, Mr. Here's your mule. But another pleasure enchanting her than these is wearing out your grinders, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Just before the battle, the general hears a roar. He says, the Yanks are coming. I hear the rifles now. He turns around in wonder, and what do you think he sees? The Georgia militia eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. I think my song has lasted almost long enough. The subject's interesting, but rhymes are mighty rough. I wish this war was over when free from rags and fleas. We kiss our wives and sweethearts and gobble goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. Peas, 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 eating goober peas. Goodness, how delicious, eating goober peas. tell you why I sang that song. One of the reasons I sang that song is because it was very, very popular amongst people of color. It was very, very popular during the war. This, because you see, goober peas. Goober is a West African word. It comes from the Congo. Goober, the, goober itself is not a West African word, but it derives from the West African word nguba, N-G-U-B-A, West Africa. That's where when the slaves came, they brought with them goober peas. They brought those peas with them. Now, they didn't originate in Africa. They originated in South America. But guess what? Africans have been trading with Europeans for thousands, of, well, hundreds of years prior to the slave trade between, between the New World and West Africa. So when, the, when the, you know, the people went over exploring, they came back, they brought the peas back. The first place for commercial peanut raising was the west coast of Africa. You know, that's where in 1830s, by the 1830s, the west coast of Africa was shipping out the most goober peas to all of the world, to France, 
to the new world with the slaves, one of the largest commercial products being shipped at that time out of the west coast of Africa. And who is the scientist that revolutionized the use of goober peas? Exactly. Peanuts, George Washington Carver, a slave. It's a wonderful thing to know the continuity of history. So what I want you to remember is that when you start doing and digging, you find out there were incredible opportunities for people of color in the South. They always have been. It's just that we are living at a time today that it's being swept under the rug. Not politically correct. Knowing about people like me, what can you get from that? Because I didn't sit around and blame my white neighbors and most of my neighbors that owned land were white. We weren't segregated. We lived in the same neighborhoods that came after the war. Don't believe me? Read Lerone Bennett's history up, uh, up, from the, uh, up from slavery. Jim Crow in the South was new because we were used to being with each other. We lived in each other's houses. Sometimes we were sisters and brothers. So, so that's the reason I, I sing the song, Eating Goober Peas, because it has to do, we have so much in common. We have, so, we have worked so hard to make this the great nation it is today. But a lot of people have spent their time trying to make us feel sorry and bad about what we accomplished. Now, some of you are probably saying, yeah, but if I was there, and these are white and black folks, because it's not just black folks that they want to make feel bad. It's white folks, too, if you're from the South. Oh, if I was living back there, I'd have never owned slaves. I'd have, I would have fought with Mr. Lincoln. Well, I'd have met you on the battlefield because that man was trying to get me out of this country. So people say, well, what were they thinking? What were they thinking when they went to war? I can't tell you what they were thinking. My third great grandfather fought for the Confederacy. I cannot prove that with paper because he never applied for a Confederate pension. But my cousin, I can prove. He fought for the Confederacy. He applied for the Confederate pension and he received it. That's what this book is about. He went with his young master. These are, you know, artistic representations. They went from Wilson County, they fought with the 7th Infantry, and they finished out the war, they came back, went back to the family farm, Richard's family farm. They continued working on the farm until Handy, this is my, he was married to my first cousin, three times removed, started working on the railroad, purchased his own farm, stayed in Wilson County, they remained friends all their lives. They both received Confederate pensions. My grandfather never applied for a Confederate pension, so I don't have a record, but he fought. He had a vested interest. He was protecting his land. He was vying for the right to have freedom. Even when he came back, if he was still a slave, it would have meant more freedom, more negotiation, more give and take 
between slave and master. So I can't tell you what they thought, but I can tell you what they sung. I'll place my knapsack on my back, my rifle on my shoulder. I'll march away to the firing line. Kill that Yankee soldier, and kill, kill that Yankee soldier. I'll march away to the firing line. Kill that Yankee soldier. I'll bid farewell to my wife and child, farewell to aged mother, and go and blood, join the bloody strife till this cruel war is over, till this cruel war is over. I'll go and join the bloody strife till this cruel war is over. If I am shot on the battlefield, and I should not recover. Oh, who will protect my wife and child? Care for aged mother, care for aged mother. Oh, who will protect my wife and child? Care for aged mother. If I must die for my homeland, my spirit will not falter. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Here's my heart and here's my hand upon my country's altar, upon my country's altar. Oh, here's my heart and here's my hand upon my country's altar. I'll place my knapsack on my back, my rifle on my shoulder. I'll march away to the firing line. Kill that Yankee soldier, and kill that Yankee soldier. I'll march away to the firing line. Kill that Yankee soldier. I say that I sing that to say, as a people, we are one people in this country, and we face one. We, we, we face the same obstacles, and we're dedicated to the same thing, freedom. It's always about freedom. It does not matter what side you fought on during the Civil War. You were fighting for your idea of freedom. But what is important is that we only think one side was fighting for freedom. Now, I'm a storyteller. I'm going to tell you a story quickly. This story is taken from a, an anthology of stories from um, the Georgia Sea Islands. Um, the, auth the author, the person that put the um, anthology together uh, his last name is Calcock. Yeah. He usually remembers better than I do. But it's a collection. He lived, he did the same thing as Joel Chandler Han, uh, Harris did for Uncle Remus Tell. He, he was that person. Well, these come from the Georgia Sea Islands. The Devil and Maybell. The Devil. Him can do anything. He can do whatever it takes to carry out his plan and fool people. Sometimes he make himself into wolf for kill on a sheep. Another time it takes the shape of alligator for worry on a duck and goose. Then it look like a white deer. He fly through the woods that make no noise for scared people to walk along the big road. Then. He comes to look an aisle and holler down on a chimney, terrify everybody when them to turn flour into pot. Then when Anna sick, it gone inside Anna, give Anna all sort of misery. <coughs> then again, it can take the shape of man and pass itself off for a great gentleman, long lady. There yet none know what the devil can do if he make up his mind to him. One time, there was a very pretty young woman named Mabel. Him father been rich, 
dress them up to the notch. Give them saddle horse for ride, carriage for drive, plenty of suburban for wait on them, every good biddle for eat, rocking chair for set in, and organ for play topper. All the young men in the county be to court them, try for marry them. One day, one strange man come for visit them. And dress up better now, all them tar gentlemen have on new beaver hat with shine look a glass, side whisker comb so nice, glove on the hand and new clothes, drive up in a fine carriage with four horse. And the driver have a keen lash with pop so clear on a could get him way down the road. The young lady take with him right off, have such good manners. Talk so nice, act so polite, everybody give way to him. And he outshine all them tar buckle of what been a count to get, uh, a, a court to gal. And he marry him before the week out. And he take him in a carriage and drive him off to him house. That house been in a distant part of the country, Bill on the hill. It been the finest house in the whole settlement with the eyes all round and round and inside everything looked very nice and pretty. When the devil will been the husband drive up to the step and hand the bride in the parlor, set him in one rocking chair, tell him the whole house blanks to him, must make itself satisfy and joy itself. Everything gone long, bear well for some time. And the young wife have everything him called for. One day, when the husband left the house for tend to a business, and the wife been a ramble about the room and see one key to hang up by itself, I wonder, what key that? And what door it open? It take them and try one lock after another, but the key won't fit. By me by, he gone to Garrett. See one door up there who had been locked. It picked the key to the hole and it unlocked the door. And when it opened, lo and behold, a see in the closet three young women they hang up along them neck and them been all dead. The team scared the gals so bad it scarcely have hand for shut the door and lock them again. But after a while they managed to do that. Then they make haste and hang the key where it been found them. The young wife fade for ask the husband about the team. All that joy done gone. They won't forget way, but don't know how to do them. He ain't have nobody for trust, for call for him far and bread ever come take him away. The husband been given one nice riding horse for taking pleasure long every morning and evening. The devil's so busy your wife have to ride by herself. The young wife can not say nothing not to nobody about what is seen in the closet to Garrett. They go the next morning for take it ride. And when they get out of here of the house, the young wife begin for cry, and for pity self. Say we should be back to him for our house and talk in mind that they're afraid when the husband get tired long and go kill him. Hang along them tar woman, what they in the closet to Garrett. <clears throat> him no no. The horse want him to be ride, been idiom, and the notice want him to say. All of a sudden the horse opened their mouth and asked him, missus, and they wanna know who on a married to? On a husband the devil. And when it's satisfied long honor, Gwen Bex with honor and kill honor, same look at them kill them tar wives, what he been have before he bring honor now. Young lady that's scared and ready for fall off in most faint way. It hard to flood in her breast. All this shrimp give way. It give up for loss. It begin for cry. Then it asked the horse for take pity on him. Take him back to him family. The horse sorry for him and promised for try and save him. But it tell him the next morning when they come for ride, it must fetch in the pocket four big nail what they on the mantelpiece in the devil room. And them will help them forget way. The young lady tank them very much and them gone back and nobody didn't know about this plan. The next morning, when the devil left the house for 10 to a business, 
The wife find the nail just as the husband say. A pity him in the pocket. Then they call for him riding horse and go down the road and for a ride. Same look of nothing have been happening. Same like it ever done. When they get out of sight of the horse, uh, of the house, the good horse many pace. And before noon, it tell him, Mrs. for drop one of them nail in the road. And Mrs. did drop him. And right off, one big bank of sand rears clean across the road so nobody could drive over. At night, then drop another nail. Midnight, another. And as the sun to rise, then drop the last nail. Every time the nail drop, the big bank of sand rears up and shut up the road. The horse runs so fast, a wretched Mrs. Farrah house by breakfast time in the morning. The family astonished for seeing him. And when he tell them what make them come back, the father and the brother of the young woman get them gun for shoot the devil if he come for take the gal back. The husband, when he find out the wife ain't come back from right, he began for speaking something. And after dinner, he called for him carriage and go down the road for honey wife. He take the big road, make the driver pick the, uh, put the lick to the horse, but he can't see or hear nothing about the wife. By me by, it come on top of that first bank of sand. Then him know right off what happened now. It make the horse gravel true and drive straight for the father-in-law house. When they turn in the avenue for the wife, where the wife lived, they see the the father and the, the family all at the piazza to watch the road. The father-in-law and bread-in-law have gun in them hand. The devil, him no afraid of gun. It drive right up, as the wife. Would make him run away. Before it can answer, tell him, get right in the carriage, go back home long him. A wife say, won't. Hold on to him far. With that, the devil get very vexed and sweat and say, go and carry him back anyhow. And he light out of the carriage and head for the piazza for graphy wife. The foreign raw and bread-in-law tell him for ten back, let the gal alone. But the devil won't eat him. As he rise the step, the foreign law and bread-in-law shoot the devil, long book shot. Shot drop off from that hot him. And they come right on. Dear says he been when graphy wife, he changed his mind, changed to him old self with forky tail and claw and bat wing and owl ears and he blow a fire out of his mouth. And he burned up a wife and him fara and him mara and him brother and the house and everything there in him. Not a thing left for sure where the house been. They burn up the horse too. Would help the wife to get away. Then he changed back into the shape of man, get back in him carriage, drive back to him house, same luck of nothing have been happening. The devil, the worst thing in this world and the next, me never going to have nothing to do long of Me afraid of him worse than rattlesnake. And that team, what them call hell, me never won't show, now go lying. So what does that have to do with the Civil War? It was a story of the time. And as Julia, all I can tell you, is sometimes when somebody promises you something and it sounds too good, you better stay with what you know. Mr. Lincoln had a smooth tongue, but when it come to defending my home, me and mine stayed with what they know. And that's why my ancestors fought for the Confederacy to protect what we know.
I can tell you what you would have done. I can only tell you what I did. And I can guarantee you that you can't tell what you would have done either because you didn't live back then. So I'm going to end this by singing for you one more song. And it's a song that I am proud to sing. And nobody will make me unproud. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland, in Dixieland, where I was born. Early on one frosty morn, look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Then I wish I was in Dixie. five minutes if you have a question I will try and share <laughs> you know how is it that your family got themselves uh, out of slavery and became free persons I have not found out how uh, my grandparents got their freedom I have not found the the record that I have of them being in Lagarda and Wilson County is ends in 1850 that's you know and so I haven't been able to find it from there. I just know generally how free people of color got their freedom. Uh, they were either born free, that, and, and they, which means that their mother, her, their mother would have been free. Then the children would have been free. They purchased their freedom uh, many times. You know, they worked, they saved the money, they made a deal with their masters, and and settled on a price, and they purchased their freedom. Um, they uh, occasionally people ran. Most people did not run. Running was an act of desperation. You know, when you run, you leave family, you leave home. Most people who did run were young men because they were most most often successful. I mean, that was where you got most of your success. You had to be a young man. Uh, you know, somewhere between 15 and 40 years old, and they generally ran individually. The, the things of families being saved, that was exceptional and not the rule, because running mean, meant taking your life in hands. Some people uh, did run, and their masters sort of just didn't pay them any attention, and they blended in with free people in the in, in the cities they lived. So some were emancipated. You know, the masters died and they set them free. So, you know, there are about four ways they could have gotten their freedom. 
Any other questions? I do want to say, you know, I, I did this presentation once, and it was a sister, a young black woman in the, in the um, audience. And uh, she says, well, you know, the problem with that flag is that, you know, it, it's used by hate groups. And I said, and it, it's absolutely true. But so is the American flag. You know, those hate groups carry the American flag, too. They also carry the Christian flag. So if you are willing to get rid of the American flag, get rid of the Christian flag, then, you know, sometimes you have to go beyond that. You have to think beyond that. My outlook is that if I know that some of my ancestors fought for this, then it's time for me to wonder why. And then once I find out why, then it will probably broaden my understanding of why other people fought for it and we can have a meaningful dialogue rather than knee-jerk reactions. And so that's the reason I do what I do.